Uh, was the original tabernacle, okay? And then it got moved down to Jerusalem. Well, you know, there's always been some bad blood about that, okay? A lot of people just couldn't, didn't want to go with that. They wanted it to stay up north. They wanted God to continue to, like, like make them the, the, the leader tribe, and that, but it, he didn't. God took it down with David and Solomon, and he did establish his temple. And like I said, the Jews, the house of Judah, received the, the concept of the, the, the centralized worship for the nation, and they received all sorts of mystery and all sorts of, um, on how to, the, the, the legislation in the temple worship, okay? For a long time, the, 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 the northern kingdom, there was always a run, didn't like that. And so when the, they did split, oh, let me just give you this one piece of history where Machism is important. Because when the tribes came, just about to cross the Jordan, and, and when they did, God put, divided them in half. He had them do this little object lesson. He had half of them go up onto Mount Ebal, which is right there. You can look these up on their real places, Mount Ebal. And then uh, another half went up onto Mount Gerzim. And he had them recite. Because God said, Yahweh said very clearly, if you obey me, you will have blessings. If you disobey me, there will be curses. Okay? So they were on opposite sides of the mountains, and they were reciting the blessings on Mount Gazon, and then the curses from Mount Gabal. Okay? Well, through tradition, Mount Gizem became the place where they felt that the altar should be, where they would say um, they wanted the temple to be. So there's always been, to, so, so to a certain remnant or to in, in, in tradition and religion and sort of thing to the Samaritans, they wouldn't let go of it. And they still, there were many, many, many who said, no, it's Mount Gizem and would not acknowledge that God had moved the thing down to um, Mount Mariah is it down in Jerusalem okay that's what the rub was but what Jesus said to them to the woman was look at it doesn't matter the greatest look at I'm here if things are going to change up now it doesn't matter where you worship my worshipers are going to worship me now in spirit and in truth and you can do that anywhere there's no more geography to this thing. There's no more time or space. He transcended it. There's no more you have to go down. You know, we don't do temple sacrifices anymore. That's gone, okay? Spirit and in truth, you worship him anywhere, anytime, by any people who call on his name, okay? That is like an amazing revelation. That's, that's Jesus really changed it up. But... All that being said, it doesn't mean you always throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> There's so much to be learned and gleaned. By, can, so I want to read from the Samaritan Pentateuch, okay? Because we're all going to come together in the end. I believe Jesus said there'll be one, there'll be, we're going to worship when this thing is all wrapped up, all Israel, we will finally be on the same page. <laughs> I know with men, these things are impossible, trust me. But with God, all things are possible. There will be one faith, one Lord, one God, um, you know, one spirit. We will be doing this in unity, okay, with the Father. As Jesus said, I and the Father are one, you'll be one with me and the Father. It's going to happen. But listen to this. A restore, and it's the word Tehab, which is a word they had like for the Messiah, okay, Oh, Gerizim, G-E-R-I-Z-I-M is the mount, okay? Now, a restorer will come in peace. He will rule the places of the perfect and reveal the truth. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Those who worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. Heed and hear, stand in truth, clear your arguments. You know, quit fighting. Oh, there we go. For Yahweh will judge his people. The people of Yahweh is Jacob, the branches and the chief root and the branches from fathers to son, from Noah, the root, even to the restorer, the branch. So from Noah to Yeshua to Jesus, the Messiah, the word of truth will penetrate and illuminate the whole world in which he will come to dwell. How great is the hour when one comes to hear the voice of God walking throughout the world. So I'm saying, if you're hearing my voice, if, it's, if you're feeling the love of God, it says the goodness of God brings us to repentance. He's walking right now in front of you. He's saying, open arms, come to me. His mercy. 
Okay, I gotta get through this stuff. I always stop and go on a million tangents and I'm sorry. How great is the hour when he, one comes to hear the voice of God walking throughout the world and all creatures shall be in order and bow their heads. Their hearts will shiver and their eyes droop and their limbs shake from fear on the day of judgment. We're gonna go there. And the mouth of deity will speak. Now see that I, I am he. Those who rest and know this will be saved. Now see that I, um, see I have taught you rules and judgments only be on your guard. I am he who stands above creation and above Mount Sinai. He's, and he, I am he who is, and there is none beside me. I am he who is without time and without place. You know, he said like, well, okay, I'm not going to go. I am he who planted the garden and uprooted Sodom. I am he who uprooted and stripped away. I am he who... Who, whom all belong, to whom all belongs and whom all return. I am he who puts all the living to death and makes all the dead alive. I mean, this is a powerful, powerful, powerful Yahweh, Jesus that we serve. So I wanted to give that now is, uh, now I want to read a little bit from Enoch because I want people to understand the truth. You needn't be afraid, I believe with all my heart, that the whole premise is worshiping in spirit and in truth. If you, you have the Holy Spirit, if you are truly a, a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and I hate to throw out, you know, kind of like Christianese worlds, if you have come to believe, all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the simplest way to put it. If you just want to call upon his name, Call him Yahweh, call him, call him Yeshua, call him Jesus, okay? Just acknowledge that you are a lost little person. You have sinned you, and that you just want to be part of the, the role that's called up yonder. Call upon his mercy. He will save you. He will restore you. He will put your name in the book of life. I mean, there's just promises. I said the promises, they're just, oh my gosh, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Okay, this is, and it's free. This is like the best deal in time. I don't understand. But all that being said, what's important to understand is that um, this is a free gift of salvation. How God did it, how he worked this salvation through the nations to come to a point like this, to be born, you know, over there in a geographic area and yet to have a message to ha that would permeate every culture, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation on the whole planet. And anyone out of all those groups who wants to believe in the name of the Lord and be saved, uh, that's an astounding feat, okay? I mean, you people think with their social media, oh, you know, I got a hundred likes. To I mean, we have no idea. <laughs> of the power and the penetration of the word of God in all the earth. It's amazing. But I did want to quickly read out of, uh, how much time have I got left? Out of, uh, oh boy, I'm, I've always got way more than I'm ever going to get through. Let me just see if I want to, uh, <clears throat> well, I do want to say something about Enoch because um, it is a book that has come back to us and I, 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 it, 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 I know that there's a lot of apocryphal, I've said this before, uh, wordology in it that's hard for, to understand. But if you just can stick with reading the first 16 chapters, you're going to get a whole head full of understanding about a lot of stuff that's very necessary to understand these last days, including what happened in uh, Genesis 6 and about Sodom and Gore, some of these things, what's really been going on under the radar, what, what the real big rub is, okay, why God is so angry with the wicked. Oh, uh, this is what I need to say. Because we live at the end of the age. Now, when I, people talk about, oh, it's the end of the world. No, it's not. It's not the end of the world. It is the end of the age of the wicked. Now, if you've never heard that, if you didn't really understand that that's where we're going, I mean, what a propaganda war are we in that people have not understood? This is our, uh, our enemy. I mean, hell is just too good for these people. The end of the wicked okay, very clearly delineated, and this is what, going back to what I just read here in the Samaritan Pentateuch, this is what we're talking about, um, that he says, now see that I am, 
Oh, he said that their hearts will shiver and their eyes droop and their limbs shake from fear on the day of judgment. Okay. Enoch is something very important we have to understand. The words of the blessing in Enoch, this is the very first verse in Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, the believers, who will be living in the day of tribulation. Sorry, I didn't write the book. When all the wicked and godless are to be removed. These are the tears that Jesus talked about. These are the tears. This is the point. You're going to be in one camp or the other by the time this thing is wrapped up. I, you're just going to have to make, you know, so all the fence sitters out there, the whole point is to propel you into making a decision that will be an eternal decision. So I cannot stress enough that if you just want to blow this off and, you know, go back to playing Candy Crush, you know, believe me, you are way out of your league already. I'm not understanding the multitude, of the, the, the importance of what's going on. But there is a day coming, and this is what we're coming up on. Forget about the Antichrist, forget about all that stuff. We are coming up on a day when the wicked will be removed and we will be able to go into a peaceable kingdom. There has been a group of people on this planet <laughs> since Cain who have been wicked. Now, this is one of the huge revelations. This time it's coming out and it's never going to be suppressed again. They're not going to be able to stuff it away. They're, no matter what happens, it is coming out because God said it would. Enoch, the last generation is going to get this knowledge out front and center and it's never going back in the box, okay? We are going to have a full understanding of who the kings of the earth are, what they've been up to, and how God is going to remove the wicked. You don't want to be in that camp. I believe most people are just good-hearted people and they're just so full of quote-unquote religious jargon that's so hard to figure it out and most people in their hearts really understand if God is love but there's a problem people on the planet and they have to go bye-bye. I'm not making it up and you can't there's nothing elitist and there's nothing racist about this. This is just a fact. Just read your evening news. People, so I wanted to tell you that is the first verse in Enoch. It's here again in a bunch of places. Uh, in, I want to read out of you chapter 48 a little bit, and um, uh, I think 48 and 49, because there's so much beautiful imagery. And to people to understand that the Old Testament, that they weren't completely clear. 100% clear on the Messiah and all of his names. That's what I was going to say. I have 117, I printed it out. In Hebrew, all of the names in the New Testament that refer to Jesus, okay? 117 from Hebrew, from Old Testament words that are used to describe him. I just gave you one called Tehab, which is from the Samaritan Pentateuch, okay? He's a rabbi, he's a redeemer, he's the rejected stone. He is the righteous one, he is the root of David, he is the ruler, he is the savior of all men, he is the savior of the world, he is the seed of Abraham, he is the shepherd, he is a son of Abraham, he's a son of David, he's a son of God, he's a son of man. You know, these all have nuanced, deep meanings to them. He is the son of the highest. He is the son of the living God. I mean, do you get it yet? <laughs> you know? And we're part of that. We are part of it. He's given us to be sons of God, to be grafted back in. He is the teacher. He is the amen. He is the Christ. He is the coming one. He is the deliverer. He is the door. All right? He is the Lord. He is the Lord of glory. He is the Messiah. He is the true vine. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the word. He is the word of God. He's the true and righteous wisdom. And here's what I have to just say. He is the mystery of God. Okay? He has been hidden before the foundations of the world. Now, uh, I just want to tell people, because I do my, a lot of my biblical exegesis, on a Hebraic, uh, I don't know, Hebraic system of Bible study called PARDS. It's an acronym that there's four levels of scriptural understanding in every verse. And what the last one is called a sod. I just want to give you, so I'm, this idea of the mystery of God, in Hebrew, it is sod ha Elohim. Mystery is the word sod. So it all fits. So don't tell me, you know, making this up. 
God has hidden deep things. He has sod mysteries in his word that he reveals to whoever he chooses at the appointed times because he's, he is going to get the job done. <laughs> and there are some of them are used in some of the greatest tactical moves, like when Paul got the understanding of taking the gospel to the Gentiles, okay? But we're coming up on some really major sod revelations. Again, like I said, the restoration of the whole house of Israel and the understanding of who we are. But let me give you a couple of, uh, read a couple more quick things out of Enoch, okay? Because uh, this is a beautiful one, chapter 48. And at that place I saw an, an inexhaustible fountain of justice. This is Enoch, right? And Enoch was the seventh, it says in Jude, he was the seventh from um, Adam. He was a great patriarch and he received, it says that he, like Abraham and like Moses, was able to see everything. In other words, these are people who could really see the whole mystery, the whole scope of the thing that God was doing from the beginning to the end. And they wrote about it, got told to write about it, so future generations can have a heads up. So he said, uh, and around it many fountains of wisdom, and all the thirsty drank out of them and were filled with wisdom. I mean, I want you, I want you to hear the imagery. This is all our New Testament imagery. Don't think that anybody's making this stuff up. And their dwelling places were with the just, the holy, and the chosen. And at that hour, and at that hour, let me tell you, there are appointed times. Yeshua, Yeshua came at an appointed time. And at that hour, the Son of Man was called near the Lord of the Spirits. That's how they call you. A lot of times he calls Yahweh Elohim, the Most High God, the Father, the Lord of the Spirits. It makes perfect sense. Um, let me just tell you one thing, quick thing. If you think the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is why we know that Enoch is an ancient text. Uh, it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are totally pre-Christian writings. So I just had to say that. So, uh, he, and at that hour, the Son of Man was called near the Lord of the Spirits, and his name before the head of days, and before the sun and signs were created, before the stars of heaven were made, his name was called before the Lord of the Spirits. This is talking about Jesus. He will be a staff to the just and the holy upon which they will support themselves and not fall. He will be the, he will be the light to the nations. And he will be the hope of those who are sick in their hearts. He's talking to us all these years. This is probably 5,500 years down the road. I'm reading this, and you're hearing it. I mean, this is beautiful. I just, all who, who live upon the earth will fall down before him and bend the knee to him. Where'd you hear that? Every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. And will bless and praise him and will sing psalms to the name of the Lord of the spirits. For this purpose he was chosen and hidden. Didn't we hear that God, that Christ, that God hid Christ in him from before the foundations of the world? that he was chosen for and hidden before him before the world was created and he will be before him to eternity. And the wisdom of the Lord of the spirits has revealed him to the holy and to the just for he preserves the portion of the just or the, of the believer, of the true saint. I mean, you could put a lot of words in there, the elect, because they have hated and despised the world of injustice. I'll tell you what, you can know God's calling you. If you just hate in your heart of hearts, you can see, you can, if you just hate injustice, if you understand the world is a really stinking rotten place for most of the people there, there's tons of injustices done, that, that evil is evil, that's a good indication that God, that your heart belongs to the Lord and you better give it to him quick. Because what you got to understand, there's a lot of people on the planet, there are some people who, 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 who don't feel any remorse. Who could care less? Who, who, who live to do evil? This is a revelation. But anyways. And in those days, the countenance of the... All right, so I just want to... I don't want to go on to the judgment that's coming for those who just love to do evil. Because the wicked, they're, gonna, they're just going to get rooted out. This is what it's always been about. Um, because they have hated and despised the world of injustice, have and hated all its deeds and ways in the name of the Lord. If you are a person who inherently knows that, boy, even if you work, you could do it better. There's something really wrong going on down here. You have a heart for justice, a heart for righteousness. 
Now, another here I want to read over here really quick in, uh, in um, Enoch. One of the things that's very interesting, I have to tell you this, this is a fact, people, and I proved this in, uh, I printed out in Bible, I, I do a, an online, a, an online Bible study program, and I lost that piece. I don't know where it is. I got so many papers up here. Where and this is, this is, this is proven that the Anointed One. There's one name for Jesus that we use all the time: Jesus Christ, the G Yeshua, the Anointed One. That's only found in Enoch, and yet it's used over 400 times in the New Testament. This is amazing. It says, for the wisdom, for wisdom is poured out like water, and glory does not cease before him to all eternity. For he is powerful in all the secrets of justice, and injustice, like a shadow, will end. Okay? Injustice will end, having no stability, because the anointed one has arisen before the Lord of spirits, and his glory is to all eternity, and his power to all generations. In him dwells the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of him who imparts understanding. Didn't we hear that Jesus is full of wisdom and knowledge? It's all talking the same stuff. And the spirit of doctrine of power and the spirit of those. Um, and he will judge the... And he will judge the secrets, and no one will be able to speak a vain word before him, because he is the anointed one before the Lord of the spirits, according to his will. I want to tell you something. When John the Baptist, when Jesus came to John the Baptist, Baptist to be baptized, John said to him, are you the one? He's talking about in Enoch, are you the anointed one that we've been waiting for that has been to come and John and Jesus said, well, you know, just just do it. Just just let's see. He goes under the water. He comes up and what the Holy Spirit de descends on him in full and the whole pictorial sign. Yes, he is full, full of the spirit of wisdom and truth. He is the anointed one. That's what that's the whole context. That's what John knew. He they were waiting, and he and this is the greatness of John the Baptist that he was so he was so on with the prophecy. You understand? He knew it was time, the appointed time, and he was out there in the desert getting people ready. He's coming. He's coming, people. And then lo and behold, Jesus did come. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it's beautiful. So all that being said, I, I can see that my time is running out. I didn't get to ninety percent really of what I wanted to say, but what I do want to say is it is Resurrection Sunday. And I'm going to read this last part on resurrection because honestly, what I love is that the, the science of this thing is catching up. This is what's great. But this is from a book called The Book of the Bee. Now, The Book of the Bee is a, is a 12th century book, but let me just read some quick things about resurrection in this. This is some really... This is the promise that we will have. We will be risen to eternal life, okay? Those that are dead... I don't want to even go into all that because I just got to read this. All classes and conditions of men will rise from the dead in the state of the perfect form of Christ, about 33 years of age, even as our Redeemer rose from the grave. We shall rise with all our limbs perfect and with the same constitutions without addition or diminishes. For Paul showed plainly and laid down an example of the resurrection in the grain of wheat in this parable. Just as that grows up entire with its glory without any portion of it having perished, even so we, for the whole man shall rise with all his limbs and parts and ordered in his composition is now only having acquired purification from the word is humor, humorous, but it's really the virus. And we'll get into the virus that infected mankind, iniquity, what came in in the garden. And this is not surprising, that if an earthen vessel acquires firmness and lightness when it goes into the fiery furnace without any change taking uh without taking place in its shape or form, but is, is lightened of its heaviness and density while it preserves its shape, its shape um, uninjured, so also should the Holy Spirit burn us in the furnace of the resurrection and drive forth from us all the foul material of the present life and clothe us with incorruptibility. It is sown a natural body. It raises a spiritual body. That's right out of Paul. This is the promise. And this is what the Archbishop said. We, we, you know, we're going to be in a perfected, I mean, people, if you have illnesses or sicknesses or things that are, you don't think you're the most beautiful person on the planet, whatever, look to the resurrection. How can you not love this? That we will be living forever 
in, in a body that is a spiritual, a body, and this is whole dualism, I can't go into all this, you know, a spiritually, a soul and a body that will be, is coded from the bottom up, all brand new DNA that is coded to live forever in a constant state of renewal, the top of your game. 32, beautiful, all your limbs just, it's just still the best story in town. That's the gospel. With that, I want to end and say um, good, good night, I love you, or good morning, Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, peace and shalom in Yeshua's name.